Hi everyone, my name is Ashley Santiago with Focus Schools and I am so excited to be bringing you the team from the Academy of Science and Innovation in Connecticut here to talk about some of their work over the past school year and some of their awesome success for their students. So I'd like to just give them the opportunity to introduce themselves and if you guys could just tell us who you are, what your role is and a little bit about your school. I'm Karen Mooney. I'm the principal at Academy of Science and Innovation. And uh, Academy of Science and Innovation is a 612 magnet school. Uh, we feed from 32 different towns all over the state of Connecticut that are in our rest zone. Um, and then we are have a very diverse population. Most of our students are uh, Black or Hispanic, um, but we do make sure that we have a diverse population. And students come here, they take their regular classes, but we also specialize in uh, engineering, computer science, and biotechnology. So my name is Peter Wick. I'm the Dean of Students from ASI. And uh, as far as my position with the ILT, the instructional leadership team goes, I am the administrative coordinator. Um, so I set up all of our working meetings. I coordinate the PDs that we facilitate with the staff. Um, and I meet with Brett, our focus schools liaison, once every two weeks to kind of keep a gauge of where we are in the progression of the um, focus framework and uh, and see you know what the next steps are. So, Hi everybody, my name is Kristen Judah. I teach this past year, I taught ninth grade US history at the Academy of Science and Innovation. I'm also the team leader for the social studies department and for the ninth grade team. Uh, so I did a lot of work with Pete this year with the ILT. Um, and this was kind of the first year that we really rolled out our reading initiative with our students in ninth grade, in addition to all the other grades, as Karen said, being a grade six through 12 school. Uh, so we're happy to kind of share our story a little bit. Well, we are just so excited. Um, and we just hope that you take this opportunity to sort of brag and celebrate because you certainly deserve it with the work that you've put in and the results that you've seen, despite everything that our, our students and our teachers and our school and district leaders face in these last couple of years. So um, I don't want to give any spoilers, but your students did see some pretty exciting growth in reading this year. So can you share some highlights of the progress from this last school year? We set reading as our focus. Um, that was based off of staff feedback. Um, we threw it to the staff because the staff are the ones who really are there every day working on whatever focus we choose. So. Um, our staff ultimately said that reading was the focus that they wanted to work on, reading comprehension. And uh, that was our first year of progress. The second year was really rolling out the instructional strategies that related to that and implementing an internal monitoring system. Uh, we utilized reading inventory from Scholastic, uh, our uh, HMI and HMH. And um, we, this was our first year of having kind of a scheduled uh, testing system. We did goal setting with our students. All of these things were things that we created. Um, and for me, just having that stuff was a really big uh, step in the right direction. I mean, the fact that uh, we, we were getting data is great, but then the students were being given their own data and they were being um, kind of uh, cult. <laughs> the process of goal setting was being facilitated by the teachers. So every teacher worked with students on um, where their, their students' current scores individually were and where their, uh, their ultimate goal would be for that individual student. Um, so that to me was just really exciting that students were taking ownership in a way in our school that they hadn't previously really been taking. And it was every student, not just students who uh, are, are targeted or identified as needing more intensive intervention. Like this is the student who is two grades above reading level, still making individual grade uh, goals. And then students that are four grades below reading level, making goals for themselves. Every student in our school was being given uh, this process. And I just, like, I just like the ownership. I like students driving their own process, driving their own education um, by looking at where they currently are and ultimately where they, where they need to be. So. I would kind of echo that, you know, specifically looking at, at one grade level. I'm kind of in a little bubble for grade nine, um, but seeing the students really care more about well, how did I do? What does that mean? You know, when, when they get their RI test score, it doesn't really mean anything to them. So to collaborate with them and to conference with them about 
Okay, if we put this, for example, in a Lexile chart, this means roughly you're at a grade six reading level and then setting a goal for the next time and then having them choose, okay, what do I want it to be? How can I actually make this happen? And what was really neat about rolling it out in our advisory classes is for example, I didn't, I didn't teach every student in my advisory class. They were in ninth grade, but some of them had a different teacher for social studies. So I was still able to build that relationship with them. And I think because of that, they saw this was whole school. This was not a English department led initiative or social studies or humanity. Like This is a full school. Nope, we're gonna continue this. This is gonna be all year. And we're gonna continue that work next year. So for our ninth graders knowing that, okay, we're gonna build on this in 10th grade. Now they're comfortable with what that RI testing is, but they're also comfortable with that goal setting. And so for them to kind of get excited and see, okay, what can I do? How can I show growth? But I think also equally important is having those conversations where they're trying to make those improvements and they're trying to reach their goals. And maybe they fell a little bit short or maybe they did worse than they did before and helping them kind of build that toolkit of that's okay. Like we're not putting all our eggs in this one basket and saying this test is the end all and the be all, but we're practicing reading and we're practicing kind of figuring out, okay, how do we understand what we read? It's a very simple goal, but it's so important. And we try to show them that from the adult perspective too. You know, if, if I read something, if, Karen gives me something on the budget, I'm probably not gonna really know what I'm reading. So what do I do? I use my toolkit, I reread, I look for vocab, I try to kind of piece things together. And so for students to see that adults do that too, I think that that conference time, that collaborative time is a big reason why we've seen such success and why we're specifically in grade nine, we saw students on average improve from a grade six reading level to a grade eight reading level, which means if we continue this momentum, they can graduate on grade level, which is fantastic because now they're going to be ready for college or whatever they decide to do after high school. I mean, just talking about raw numbers, um, our, our school as a whole was roughly around, I want to say like 35% on level. Um, and I know ninth grade, ultimately work their way up to like, I think one out of every two students was on level, um, which is an awesome improvement. Um, and like Ms. Judah said, if we can keep up that momentum and, and that trajectory, um, we'll be seeing great success. And obviously we would, you know, one of the things that we try to do is we always try to celebrate those small successes, even if they are small, um, because that is what helps propel the momentum. So I know like for ninth grade, I didn't go on it, but you guys as a group did, decided to do a field trip to celebrate all of the, the work that the students put into it to the library, which, you which know, was awesome. <laughs> which when, when you're in ninth grade, it's like oh, the library, but the students were genuinely excited about the field trip um, because it was a kind of a culmination of all of their hard work all throughout the year. Um, because I know that the ninth, we couldn't have done it without the team. The teachers really bought into it and uh, it was a constant part of the conversation. And so to see it come to fruition with this end of year trip to the library um, was just something that the students really bought into and were really excited about. You know, I grew, I grew as a student and then this person next to me grew, they might've grown a completely different amount or, or a different level, but we grew together as a, as a group and we're gonna celebrate that at the end of the year. So, you know, in other grade levels, they also had a lot of success. Um, There's a lot of different ways that the teams ultimately utilize the data to kind of drive instruction and figure out how to focus on um, different reading strategies. Uh, so seeing like the seventh grade, they had a very different way of approaching um the process it was theirs was more about um what happened like i know that you were talking about doing the conferencing but a lot of what they did was wh what do we do um for leveling texts within our classrooms um so a lot of the teachers in the seventh grade it, which is really exciting as an administrator to see is you know going into a classroom and not seeing one text for every single student in the room seeing three or four texts and giving students texts based on where they're like that's just really 
exciting because you are taking the person in front of you and you are doing something for that person based on who they are. It's not a one size fits all type thing. Um, and I know you guys did that in ninth grade too, but uh, I work more with middle school than I do with, uh, with the high school. So I see it in practice. You know, I saw those things um, in the classrooms when I would go and visit, I would see the groupings based on their reading level. So um, to see our focus lead to instructional strategies, lead to change in practices is just a, a really nice continuum of, uh, of, of ripple effects, I guess. So it's, it's just so exciting to hear because reading, especially in the secondary grades, it's not always, there's not always time right? Like we think about when kids are in like the upper middle school grades and high school, like we're not often talking about and finding time to teach reading skills explicitly. We're just kind of hoping they already have them and so often they don't. So you guys figured out how to do that. And it's, it's so incredible to hear um, about, you know, you figured it out and you're doing it for your kids and they're moving and your students are buying in too. And that's just, that's huge. So it's, for me on the outside, it's so exciting to hear and, and to just witness this incredible work that you're doing. But I, I, so I do have just a couple questions in case we have other folks who are, you know, watching and they're like, how, how do you do this? Because, you know, maybe, maybe I am an English teacher in a high school or an assistant principal in a high school. And I'm just like, how, how do I make this happen? How do my math teachers and science teachers buy into a reading goal when we have to focus on you know, the ever increasing, you know, math standards or science standards. How do you, you talked a little bit about the staff decided that this is where they wanted to go, uh, but sort of how'd you pull it off? Because you guys made it work and in not so easy circumstances, right? So can, can you fill us in a little bit more about how you were able to, again, come to that reading goal and then, and then work towards it? Like what did your team do in case there are folks who are trying to figure out how they can do this in their school? So our work with focus schools, they really helped us and guided us along the way. We did meet with them monthly, um, mostly through Zoom, just because of the circumstances of the past year. Um, we're excited to have those meetings in person next year. Um, but they helped guide us on how to do that work. And as Pete said, we really had to get buy-in from the staff to make it work at all. So once they said, you know, reading comprehension is where they wanted to go, the team did a phenomenal job then coming up with before, during, and after reading strategies that could be across discipline. Mm -hmm. And that was really our focus and the team delivered that PD three times a year with follow-up of this is what you need to do. And these are the conversations that you need to have for how are you implementing those before, during, and after strategies. So even in PE class, we can still work on reading comprehension because there are still things that they have to read. I mean, reading is crucial to go forward in any subject. Um, and it's a great life skill that we have to make sure that every kid that leaves ASI has. And so that was a big step and goal that we did. And the team was there all the time meeting and talk, discussing how that was gonna happen and getting feedback from the staff on the PDs to shape the next PD for them. Uh, look, I, I, I was a teacher for a long time before becoming the Dean. Um, and Ms. Judah and I have talked about this, about how, um, cause I was a teacher at the school before I was the Dean here. And we've talked about how educational and pedagogical uh, initiatives come and go, right? You, you see these things pop up and you put a, a good old try for a couple months, maybe half a year, maybe even a full year. And then what happens, you know? Um, and, and for this one, there was something different about it. There was, uh, I, I think what Ms. Mooney just said is so important um, where she talked about how reading is a life skill. And because teachers brought reading to us, they bought into it more, but then we were also able to push the narrative more of this is something that is fundamental. It is not a, 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 an ELA class uh, skill. It is not a history skill. Um, it is a skill for citizenship, you know? And I think that that was an easier buy-in for a lot of adults. Don't get me wrong. There's definitely going to be people who kind of drag their feet um, but, and I, again, with Ms. Drew, I've talked about how, um, you know, Ms. Drew and I work a lot together. So we talk about a lot of these things. And I've talked about how for a lot of your classes, um, they're just kind of core requirement classes. And what is the end goal for those classes? You know, if I'm a student who has no interest 
in biology. What does biology mean to me? <laughs> I'm taking it because I have to kind of thing. And I think that uh, my analogy for that is driving a, driving on a road trip with no end destination in mind. You know, why, what, is, what are we working towards? And I think reading makes that a destination, like reading can be that destination. Uh, you can put reading into biology class and make it something that that student gets out of that class, even though biology itself isn't something that that student wants to do in their career, um, because they can still get reading. And we also are just very transparent about that with our with our staff. We understand that reading is not something that everybody feels very confident in. Um, so we are going to take our time and we're going to allow you the opportunity to take risks as teachers and make mistakes and, and not hold that against you. We're actually going to hold you up and support you in those ventures, you know, because we understand that this is something that is new to us. And so um, we're very transparent with with understanding where teachers are coming from. But we do expect this to be not one of those initiatives that falls by the wayside because it is such a fundamental skill. So when I would do communication with the staff, I would always put it out there. We're very happy and excited by by uh, the support or, that you are putting into this initiative. And we understand that it's difficult, but we thank you for all the effort that you're putting into it. And we know that this isn't gonna go perfect the first time around. It's gonna take a lot of time. It's going to be something that is always a process. We talk about that all the time. Are the things that we have set in place going to be permanently in that format for the rest of our existence as a school? Absolutely not. It's a process, it's gonna take time. Um, so some of the things we did this year are things that are not going to stay in place next year and that's okay. And, um, but we're still working towards that ultimate goal of reading comprehension skills. I think just to kind of echo what Pete and Karen just said is, I can't emphasize enough how much of this has been collaborative teamwork. A lot of times when there are new initiatives, they're from the top down. And so you'll have an administrative team be like, this is what you need to do, go get it done. And maybe there's a little bit of follow through. This was really the opposite where we had the support of the administrative team and focus schools with Brett um, and certainly with Pete kind of taking the, the spearhead of everything. But the committee itself that would be, you know, twice a month in addition to those full meetings once a month during the year is made up of teachers. And I think other staff and other teachers see that. And every month when Pete would send out, you know, here's our update, here's our bulletin, here's some PD stuff that's coming up. There's always an invitation for staff, come join us. If you wanna be part of this group, please join us. And so we have a group of teachers who have made this commitment and we, because we're still teaching, we're still in that classroom, I think that makes it a safer space for other teachers and staff. And so we've created this environment of it's okay to fail, but come join us. Let's try it out. Let's do this. We're all here to help. And by having a lot of the teachers present the PD adds to that buy-in. And like Pete was saying, you know, come to the PD with a reading. Even if you're not sure if this is what you're going to use in your classroom, come to the PD with it. We're gonna show you the before strategy and then you're gonna have some collaborative time to create one. And I know that's been really critical for my team of teachers because we've decided to make similar strategies. So for example, we all decided to make an anticipation guide as a before strategy. And so we made a couple different versions of it. So not only do the kids understand when we say anticipation guide, but the staff also understands. And that includes, for example, like the social worker who works with the ninth grade students, she used the anticipation guide with her small groups. So this is not something that's just limited to teachers. It's really a whole staff initiative. And I would say if, if other schools and other teachers are really looking at well, where do we even begin, you do have the whole testing part, you have the whole data part, but ultimately it has to be this mindset of collaboration and support. And that's what Karen and Pete and the rest of the admin team have really set the tone for that to say, we are all in this together. We all wanna see those data points improve, but we all wanna make sure that 
we're all on board. We're all here to help each other. We're not here to criticize. You know, we, we invited staff to come in and observe different teachers who were trying out these strategies. They weren't evaluations. It was, hey, come to my room. Let's, let's see what's working, what's not. Give me some pointers. And I think as we continue to build on that, that's where we're going to see that continuation of growth because then students see that. Students see that all the teachers and staff are on board and we're all helping each other achieve this one big goal that really is never ending. Like you're always striving to be a better reader, a better comprehender, a better understander of society and what's going on. And so it, it creates a really positive atmosphere. I think you guys have hit on some really critical points and, you know, the, the, the teamwork, the collaboration, um, the investment of the staff and sort of, again, not it not being a top down, but it being this whole school initiative is, is so critical. And, and you guys figured out how to do that and you're making it happen. And now I hope that uh, it is summertime. So I hope you are getting um, at least a little bit of a break right now. But in thinking about next year, what is um, what is implementation of this look like next year? What are your plans for next year? And and sort of, um, you know, are you setting some different kinds of goals? Still focus on reading comprehension. What does that look like? Talk to us about your plans for next year. So there are definitely nuances that we have to work out. Um, we are planning as an ILT to meet this summer before the school year starts to kind of iron out some details, but. Uh, roughly, I would say a lot of what we want to do is fine tuning things that needed to be fine tuned and uh, taking things to the next level. So I think right now it was kind of an exploratory moment for students and teachers to utilize the before, during, and after strategies in their classroom in pockets here and there where it seemed appropriate, um, maybe changing, you know. As a, as a science, because I was a science teacher, changing what I did from being kind of lecture or labs to let's do a reading today, um, making that not a departure from the norm, but making that the norm. Um, and, and having it, we always talk about um, the implementation should be every student, every classroom, every day. And um, I think that that's where we want to move. You know, I think the first year is really just kind of trying it out, seeing what happens, seeing the results. And next year is hopefully a much more holistic, uh, immersive experience with the reading strategies for all students at all levels. Um, you know, we sixth grade is an entry point. I would love for those sixth graders to come in and see reading in every classroom from day one and just know that that's the way it is moving on all the way up through 12th grade. I think our, our current crop of students who are moving up from seven to 12, um, it was kind of something that was put into their process throughout the year. The new students that are coming in, hope, like that should be the mindset right from day one. Um, so that's part of it. I think we also want to make more professional learning opportunities for staff to visit each other's classrooms and see, like Ms. Judah was saying, the strategies in place um, with, with COVID and the craziness that was last year. It was really difficult to get teachers to be um, given those opportunities to go and visit classrooms and see the tools in place, um, especially in, in places that make sense for them to go and visit. Um, but uh, next year, I, you know, I think the, the ILT is really hoping to devote much more time um, to giving teachers those opportunities, which I think will be easier to do because now we have the process in place. You know, we did the process, we developed the process, we developed the protocol, what it looks like before visiting, debriefing after, um, how do you, you know, take what you saw and incorporate it into your classroom. Um, that was something we all had to work on, but now that we have it, it'll be much easier to kind of roll it out and have teachers do it on a much more regular basis. I think for a grade level, you know, we're, we're certainly looking at hopefully testing students earlier in the year, you know, since last year was our first year, we weren't really able to kind of go through the first round of testing till November, which, which wasn't a bad thing because we still rolled out, you know, what's the purpose of reading and what are the before strategies. So 
you can always still move forward even if something is not quite ready. And I think that's another good takeaway that we learned from this year. You can always move forward with some aspect of the plan even if everything doesn't always fall into place. And so I think what we're looking at is how do we get student buy-in when they're by themselves? So what I mean by that is we had great success with students investing in their reading in the classroom um, and also with these RI tests. And as we were starting to kind of notice as the year was going on, we were seeing improvements in their reading scores. But if they're left on their own, for example, to silently read, like we had silent reading for an advisory time, roughly 30 minutes once a week, a lot of times we were noticing that students were either picking books that they've read before, books that were multiple grade levels lower than where they are, or they would just kind of pick a book and almost kind of like randomly turn a page. And so how do we get them to want to read on their own when there's nobody telling them, okay, you're gonna take a little test on this. Okay, we're like, we're doing a little competition to see you know, who can improve the most or when, when there almost seems like there's there's no prize. How do they, how can we get them to still want to do it? How do we develop that self and that self-motivation to actually read on their own? And that's something that we really want to take some time next year to kind of dive into. How do I get you to want to read even when there's nobody around telling you that you should read? And that's what really why we took the kids to the library. Our school does not have a library. Um, and so when we decided to make this trip to the library, it was, not only was a success of their RI scores, but we also did a monthly reading challenge of different level text. And I think we wanna do more of those next year. But it was also for the kids to get to learn, this is what libraries have to offer. And it's more than just books. It's all different kinds of reading material. It's all different opportunities to join different kinds of reading groups or social groups. They have free tutoring. They have, we wanted them to see, especially because the majority of our students come from urban areas, which have very large libraries. They usually have multiple branches of libraries that are close to where our students live. You should want to go to the library. They have stuff that will interest you. You know, we had one of our students who, who has one of the lower level uh, RI scores. When we went to the New Britain Public Library, he checked out six books on anime and he had already started reading them before the day was up. And so that was good for us to see too, because we don't get to see them in that environment. So, you know, Pete talked about before about, you know, really knowing the child. And part of that knowing is what are you interested in and how can we infuse reading into your interest so that that drives you, so that you want to read, you want to learn, and you want to do more on your own. And I think that's really where we're looking for high school. How do I get you to want to read on your own, especially if you've never really wanted to read and you're already 14 or 15? And it's not too late, but it's just changing that mindset. I would echo what they both said. I would also say, you know, when I first met with Brett, when we were going to bring on focused schools and start this process, you know, he was pretty clear that it's not a one year and done. And so I wanted to make sure that our staff knew that, like, it's not, this is this year's initiative and next year we're going to have a new one. So we told them it was going to be a three to five year process. And so we're not changing from reading. It's going to be a three to five year process. We're going to keep refining it and making it better. Um, and that's how we're going to see the growth and the improvement. Um, and I think that the staff knowing that is like next year, it's not a whole new set of initiatives. And now we're going to do something new has really helped them buy in as well. Like they understand, nope, we're not changing. It's still reading. We're just going to refine it. Like Pete said, like we have these tools. Now let's fine tune them. Now let's bring the student buy in in place. Let's see how we can make it even better. And on top of that, um, just making it so that it's it's okay when things don't fall into your your 
your preset timeline. Um, I, I don't know about Ms. Judah and Ms. Mooney, but I am a little bit of a perfectionist when it comes to things. And coming into ILT with that mindset, it was like, oh, it's supposed to be done by this day, by this. And, and Brett's like, no, <laughs> like, it's okay if it takes two months longer than you originally planned. That's okay. As long as the ball is still rolling and the progress is still being made. And um, when we would go through the focus frameworks and look at the indicators and look at them and see like, oh, we still have to work on this one. And we've been saying that for the last two meetings. That's still okay. You know what I mean? That's be, that, that just means that with your school specific situation and environment and culture at that moment, that indicator wasn't the top priority, but it will become a priority as you start to iron out all of the other indi indicators. And that's okay. That And for a perfectionist, that was really hard to kind of let go of, but uh, I, I now take a lot of pride in, in, when we do get to change our indicators to green because we've moved on to the next phase. You know what I mean? Like, um, so that's, that's good. But at the same time, um, we want to get it to a point where we iron out the details so, so much so that um, if I miss an ILT meeting, even though I've been kind of the administrative kind of uh, facilitator, the meeting can still kind of take place without me because it's not dependent on any specific person. It's dependent on the group. Um, we we want to get to that point next year specifically where when new staff come in, we give them kind of the toolbox and we say, this is what we've worked on. This is what an expectation of you is in your classroom at our school. And here are the things that you can use in your classroom to help you meet the desires of the overall school's focus, you know? Um, Cause that's, that's when you know, I think what Ms. Judah was kind of touching upon was like the culture of the students, right? Like there's a culture of reading in our school that we're still working on. Um, and we definitely have pockets of success in specific grades, like in the middle school, we started doing um, uh, book raffles for students. Um, so when they do their RI, they get tickets because they've done a good job. And I've told the teachers, you have to be honest with the students. If they are doing a great job while they're doing their assessment, give them a raffle ticket. And the students get so excited when they get to see either their friends win books, um, you know, they get to come up and I pick very, I, I'm, I'm the one who gets all the books. I pick like all varieties of books because I want to be reflective of the students' cultures and, um, and diverse in their, uh, their, their choices. So they get really excited about being able to put their tickets in, let's say, a Marvel, you know, um, graphic novel because some students are really, you know, propelled by some stuff like that. Other students, they want that thick book that has 400 pages because they love reading so much. So they get excited. But, you know, and so just giving them those opportunities and working on the culture of this is something that can be fun for you if you allow yourself to kind of work out what is interesting to your to to your uh, you know what meets your interests, like Miss Judah was saying. So um, that's something that we're still working on too is the the culture that goes with reading in our students. Well, I just want to thank you guys so much. Um, again, so so exciting to hear about the work that you're doing. Again, just incredible that in the face of all of the challenges that you and your teachers and, and your staff were dealing with last year with COVID, with, with everything that's sort of flying in the faces of educators, you guys still made this happen. And you talked about all of these pieces for next year, about places that you wanna grow and refine, but he, as you said, even though it was just starting the process, even though there are pieces that you look at and say, we're not there yet, you still had such incredible growth for your students. So I just wanna congratulate you, your team, your students. And, and it's just so exciting and, and inspiring. And this is, you know, this is why we do this. This is why we do this work is for our students and to, and to watch them grow and to soar and it's incredible. So I just wanna thank you so much for your work, for sharing your story and, and just sort of as we wrap up, um, you know, are there any last sort of messages or pieces of advice that you would give to an educator or a school or district leader who's thinking about like, you know, how do I bring this to my school? Any sort of like last closing 
um, nuggets of advice from your experience? I would encourage district leaders to give it a try. It really um, was eye-opening and Brett is great along the way because even though we had our monthly meetings as a team, um, I had individual meetings with him, just like, it's okay. If you don't have the answers, you know, we'll make it. And also to take a back seat because I had to take a back seat in the process so that they would take ownership and kind of empower Pete to take um, the process and help lead the team who did a phenomenal job with it. And so having those meetings and doing those things where there's a lot of behind the scenes work that's wonderful as well. And I look forward to where we'll be, you know, three years later with this initiative um, to see wonderful results. And I would also, he let us reach out to some schools he's also worked with. And so that helped too, to talk to them and get their perspective. So I knew what I was walking into um, before. But I would encourage, give it a try. It really um, was a great process. I think the teachers enjoyed it as well. Um, and it's one that we look forward to for the next two to three years. I would say um, for, in terms of advice, I don't think it really matters what your focus is. I think if you take an initiative, what Ms. Mooney just said, that, that recommendation goes across the board for whatever the initiative is. Um, so like, I, I would say whatever the initiative is, reading or not, take your time. Don't worry about rushing through things. We wanna, you know, solve all the world's problems in one year. It's just not realistic, but solve little problems along the way and support growth a little bit along the way. That's great. Um, and then celebrate those successes that you get. Make sure that the celebrations are public because the more you celebrate, the more people realize there's a stake worth fighting for. And that, that's what propels it. That's what gives it the momentum that Ms. Judah was talking about before. Um, I would also make sure that you seek lots of different input. Don't just ask the standard go-to teacher leaders because they will give you the answers you want as administrators. You know, that's why they're teacher leaders. Seek input from everybody. Um, I think what Ms. Judah said about having um, counseling do these things is important. We have MLL teachers on our team. Um, we definitely pull in special ed teachers. We pull in interventionists uh, because we want everybody to have something to say so that what is handed down to the teachers isn't like um, Ms. Mooney and Mr. just said, just kind of given by the, the administrators, it's given by this team of people who all have a stake. Um, and then at the end of all of it, make sure, and this is one of our standards for, because we set our own standards as a team when we meet and do our working meetings, make sure that your students are always at the center of what you're doing. Um, there's no, like, that's why you're in the job. That's the career that you chose. Um, and Sometimes it's easy to say like, this is something that is contrary to what I normally would have done given my capacity in my job. But if at the end of the day, going in a different direction supports the students in their growth, then consider it, you know, give it a shot because that's what the job is. You, you're there to help students, you're there for the students. So keep the students at front and center in everything that you do. I guess my one, my one piece of advice would be to work collaboratively. And that's a word that's used a lot, but it's rarely actually done with fidelity long-term. And that's something that, you know, as a high school teacher, oftentimes, high school level teachers are not in teams. You know, I've been more fortunate with ninth grade. We are a little more team oriented, but even if you're a large high school, you can still work collaboratively. So whether you have weekly PLC meetings or weekly data meetings, whatever you have, you know, find, find that team of people around you that's going to inspire you. Just as Pete said, to, to keep the students as the focus and there's going to be good days and bad days. And that team of people is kind of what helps you get through it. Like, oh, this, this, this new plan went, went completely awry. The kids didn't like this. They didn't score well on this. But that's okay because you have a whole team of people and you want that team of people to get bigger and bigger so that you create a staff and a culture that's excited to go to work. They're excited to work with students. They want to help students. Students see that 
and then they want to create that own culture too. So I'd say definitely take it one step at a time. You know, this is this has been for us on the, on the teacher side two years of going through this, but it has felt more manageable than any other initiative that I've been part of because it's step by step, little by little, and a constant. How are we doing? How is everybody feeling? Do you have questions? Do you want to participate? Like all the stuff that we as teachers try to do for our students, we also have to do for each other in terms of making sure that we are all okay, that we're all on board, we're all here to help. Failure is okay, because that's how you learn to be more successful. So I think I would say dive in, don't be afraid to dive in. If you're able to be part of a team that is able to help lead some of this initiative. It's, it's awesome being part of it and build yourself around those people with you because that's where you'll see the greatest amount of success. So take a deep breath and know that success will come if you have a really good positive culture. I wanna thank you all so much um, for your time, for coming in, for sharing your story, for the work that you were doing for your students. You are heroes your team members, your teachers and other leaders are heroes. Thank you for what you do every day. It is a privilege and an honor to get to work with you and to get to witness the work that you're doing for your students. So thank you for what you do every day and for sharing your story today. Um, we're just, again, so lucky uh, to get to work with you and, and to get to celebrate this story. It deserves to be shouted from the rooftops and celebrated because you are putting in the work and getting results for your kids. So thank you for the heroic work you do every day. Everyone, once again, thank you for joining us. My name is Ashton Santiago with Focus Schools.